a tour of Soweto. So what you're looking at now uh, is a soccer city stadium. This is the biggest stadium in the country. It's a 95,000 capacity stadium. But during the World Cup, they cleared 5,000 seats right in the center on the front rows for people on a wheelchair, disabled people, so that they can have their own clear place to stand. Um, so it was a great achievement for the country uh, to actually have the World Cup over here. And uh, this actually is a stadium that was not completed until uh, about two months before the start of the World Cup. But uh, yes, everything was completed in time and uh, the event became a success. And so yeah, we are on the map for having achieved well and great for the World Cup. Now, going back to the history of Johannesburg, we mentioned that um, uh, the discovery of gold was in 1886 in February by George Harrison, the Australian one, and clearly not the, <laughs> the musician one. And uh, when that gold uh, was discovered, um, the gold rush began in Johannesburg, and uh, lots of it saw a lot of people from neighboring countries in Africa, <coughs> sorry, for migrant, um, you know, to become migrant laborers, and uh, lots of other people from different other parts of the world who were seeking the fortune uh, to be in the gold industry as well. So all that uh, happened, and um, it was only in 1900 that the first gold, uh, that the first group of um, uh, black people was moved from Soweto, I mean from downtown Johannesburg, um, to be moved to the southwestern direction. Initially what had happened in 1900 is that uh, the areas where everyone was settled in, was living around, had developed what was known as the bubonic plaque. Now, the bubonic plaque, as we all know, is a rat disease, uh, which is quite brutal, you know, if it's not quickly attended to. And so they actually had to destroy that slum area where everyone was living together. Um, and um, to clear the area, to put up proper infrastructure after they had banned that little village. But it is actually the time when the ministry the dutch regime at the time decided that they would have then to clear the first group of black people to the southwestern direction and that's what led to the development and the start of Soweto in 1900. It, 1910 was a year when apartheid was officiated but i should say that prior to that year there were lots of other policies that were being developed like that were still part of the divide and rule policies. But to make apartheid a law with lots and lots and hundreds and hundreds of um, sets of laws, um, like the Group Areas Act, um, you know, where they would separate groupings or um, uh, natives, uh, uh, they would separate different races of people and ethnic groups according to their plan. In other words, they would not live together. Those laws were forming part of apartheid, but many other laws had developed before. Because if you look at the beginning of mining, you would still find that it was only the black laborers, mostly, that you'd find underground. And you would not find mostly, um, you know, the same colors working during, I mean, within the same area. So they had already started encouraging or practicing the divide and rule policies, although it was not officiated until 1910. So apartheid only started in 1910, and it ended in 19. I mean, in, in, in 1948 was made a law, and it ended in 1991. But in 1910, the regime, uh, the, apartheid, the, the the Dutch regime, actually became um, superior. It started ruling over the whole country. Prior to that, they just had their own state um, in uh, Pretoria and Bloemfontein. In other words, the, deep, the British were still in control, pretty much in control, until 1908, in, in 1910, 
when 1910 the Dutch became the real rulers of the whole country. In other words, the Dutch uh, were they was they were handed over the country to them because there was no there were not necessarily ne ne elections or anything like that that actually took place. In about a kilometer, we'll be entering Soweto. And, um, but the first part that you are going to see is the part of Soweto that is more affluent. It's actually the part of Soweto that um, many people have built houses for themselves in. And here's a welcome sign on our left that says welcome to Soweto and as usual tourists that are visiting Soweto we've got um, visitors to Soweto almost every day it is true that Cape Town is the um, is actually the tourist destination in the country the number one tourist destination but it is also true that um, Soweto is a number one tourist attraction in the country. You'd find people who'd spend time in Soweto, but they would not make, miss you know, coming through to Soweto. Speed cameras hiding, hiding the car there. They want to get us. So this is the... Um, what I would refer to is the more affluent part of Soweto, where um, the rent value is much better than any other part of Soweto. And if you look around, you'd see that the, the main means of building in Soweto or in Johannesburg or in South Africa in general is by use of brick. I know in other different countries, people use different things and means, but here they use brick in order to build. And um, on our left, we've got a school. It's always a question as to why do you find, you know, security fencing around schools. But uh, there's been a lot of challenges with younger people doing drugs and uh, others coming to school, you know, standing outside the fence to come and sell drugs to the students in school. So um, it's always important to try and protect the, school, the, 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 the children that are inside school from the ones that are not inside school. And um, generally you would also see that we've got high walls like everywhere. Uh, we come from a very rife history of uh, Soweto being the most dangerous township in the country. It is not true that Soweto is still dangerous. When I was born in Soweto many years ago, um, Soweto having so many subsections was very difficult to move from one subsection to another section because of fear of gangs and um, you know and crime but uh, today Soweto has become a type of a township where uh, young white boys and girls come to Soweto just for clubbing at night by themselves so that can be marked as a huge improvement so it is now referred to as one of the safest townships because white people come to town by themselves to come clubbing, you know, in Soweto. On the right, we've just passed one of the few, um, you know, playing fields for kids. That type of infrastructure or, or recreational facilities were not there when I was still a young boy growing up in Soweto. But it is fortunate for, uh, for kids today that they do have these facilities in order to play, you know. So the high walls come from the history of crime, but also people, you know, seek. There's also another reason where people seek, you know, privacy, hiding themselves between high walls. But also it has become the feel and the look and the feel of the area. You find a person that is building a house recently who feels that the crime is not really a big major issue affecting them but they still decide to put up high walls because of how the whole neighborhood feels like. I mean, the whole look and feel of the neighborhood.
might stop here for a second. When you look to the left, you will realize that it is totally a different setting. These mass housing facilities that you see on the left were meant for mining, migrant laborers. They came and settled here. Uh, the government put up these, you know, the mining houses put up these houses for them to live in here. They um, were squashed inside here. Um, one house, which is actually the two windows, would have a minimum of 12 men that lived in them. Inside these houses, there's banks, concrete banks on walls. Now, if you look in terms of the four partitioned or four rooms inside, um, in each section, what you would categorize as one room would have six banks. Okay. Um, well, actually, would have, um, yeah, the whole house would actually have 12 concrete banks and which was not necessarily the easiest way of living you know sleeping on concrete on walls but it was meant for migrant laborers to live in their conditions and the one sad part is that they were not allowed to bring their families to live with them in them so you had people stuck inside here worked in the mines didn't have their families with and um, they would need, um, there would be minimum of 18 months contracts that they would actually spend in the mines. So they ended up not seeing their families for almost two years. And one of the biggest tendencies is that a lot of men never went back home to their rural families that had left. And when you look at the old movies, you'd see they were about women who went to Johannesburg to come and look for their husbands. It was a common occurrence. So a lot of men then started their fam other families here in Soweto. And a lot of other men also started engaging in homosexual activity, which was as a result of this setting of community, which destabilized the family lifestyle. Now, you will see that um, um, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, there's been new houses that are being built for them. These are the new infrastructures by the government to correct the, you know, this um, houses have all the infrastructure. Remember, these are free houses that the government builds for people. And more than being free, they also, uh, you know, for each family, each family has got their own house with running water, uh, sanitation, uh, everything inside, electricity. They pay for electricity usage and um, they um, get 6,000 liters of free water every month. Every Puara community gets 6,000 liters of free water every month in their household. So you can see the houses on the left hand side, uh, like the brown colored houses. These are all the new houses that the government is now building for people in Soweto. The free houses in order to try and correct the past challenges. And, and you can see they're quite nice houses. I would love to receive a free house like that. Government still is still responsible for cleaning up. But uh, as you can see, actually, you, as much as you can see, there's a bit of litter there in them. So it is practically one of the cleanest areas you can see around. Because government is responsible for cleaning. In fact, all the townships and communities, government is responsible for cleaning. Looking across um, the freeway, the walls, all the walls that you see on the left, that is the Baragonath Hospital. Now, from where we are, towards the end of the...